now on BBC4, Time Shift brings back all sorts of memories of when TV drama had to get it right live on... Nine. Eight, eight, seven. Six. Five. Four. Three. Oh, good evening, all. On pace! Watch a TV drama today, and you can expect blemish free performances, slick picture editing, and a polished production that's only possible because it's recorded. But the first TV dramas had to get it right live on the night. Just before the transmission, there would be silence in the studio, please. We'll shortly be on live. Stand by. Going out live really had, it just made it completely real. I think it's fair to say that when the camera was on you in Z-Class, that you felt all that 80 million people. Do and cut. Tonight, Time Shift tells the story of the often ambitious beginnings of live TV drama. It's also the story of how television is rediscovering the power of live drama. Help! This was so ambitious and you knew you weren't going to be able to do it again. I don't think there'll be many people working in drama who at some point or another haven't fantasised about how fantastic it would be to do something live on television. Good luck, studio! And then, oh, your guts went into your heart. All right, stand by then, please. Stand by, Jim. Here we go, absolute quiet. Quiet! Quiet! Welcome to a first. Never before have we tried to bring you live, uncut theatre performance of Shakespeare. In 2003, BBC Four broadcast Shakespeare live from London's Globe Theatre. For God's sake, speak comfortable words. Should I do so, I should belie my thoughts. Comfort's in heaven. We are on the earth. <laughs> The event was subconsciously drawing on TV drama's theatrical beginnings. In the early days of the BBC, one of the first outside broadcasts came from St Martin's Theatre, London. It was a relay of the 1938 production of a J.B. Priestley play called When We Are Married. Now we're on you one, we're mixing to two. All pre-war TV drama was firmly rooted in theatre with dozens of formal productions broadcast live from Alexandra Palace. The station was only transmitting 22 hours of programmes a week, but soon as much as 14 hours of this was live drama. Now, cameras, please. Here are the instructions. Producers in those formative days only had theatre as their guide. They had no kind of visual language that they could draw on, and they looked very much to the theatre for their directors initially, and the directors drew on actors they knew, so they also came from the same kind of pool. Currently on stage in the mousetrap at the original St Martin's Theatre is one of those repertory actors. Peter Byrne learnt to use the new technology of TV in the early years. Not having an audience sometimes was a bit of a drawback to some actors, you know, in, in the early days of television. I came out of weekly rep out of the theatre and television was in its infancy. What? Detective Sergeant Crawford, Police Constable Dixon. Peter Byrne is best known for his role in Dixon of Doc Green, but he learned his craft on many earlier live productions. Suddenly being pitchforked into television, a totally new medium, which was continuous, was going to be live, there were going to be terrible distractions all over the place. You had no yardstick, you had no, no benchmarks, you, you know, you were making it up as you went along. A lot of actors hated live television, you know, stage actors. I loved it um, because you sense that there were 7 million, 15 million, how many millions of people there were out there. And there was this sort of nervous energy in the, the studio. There was that unnatural quiet, except for the swishing and all the noise and the, the mayhem and so on. Well, I'm heading west myself with the capital the government allows me and what I can save out there. I'm hoping one day to own a farm myself. I did a, a thing called the New Canadians. We were on board a ship emigrating to Canada <laughs> because they couldn't take us out and stick us on a boat. They had the stagehands 
<laughs> in the scenery and rocking us gently. <laughs> Tell me, when they found out in that labour exchange that you were English too, did you get lynched? Marved, I had a few anxious moments. But remember too that it wasn't just the actors who were, who were learning and desperately just trying to keep going, but it was the technicians as well. They had to experiment live on air as there was still no video recording, but they did have repeats of a sort. Remember these days when you see a repeat, when we used to do a repeat in the old days, uh, you had to come in again and, and, and do it live. And quite often you do the, the performance on the Tuesday and you do it again on the Friday. And quite often the shift had changed as far as the dress crew might even have a different crew. So, I mean, you were fighting time all the time. It was living dangerously. Good evening, everybody. This is a very exciting moment for us in television. But tonight I'm not speaking to you from the familiar studios at Alexander Palace, but from a small room in the new transmitting station at Southern Coldfield. By the early 1950s, the BBC had opened up more transmitters across the country, massively increasing TV audiences. But its dramas were still relying on a theatrical heritage which didn't always match the taste of the widening viewing public. <laughs> I've lost my job. Again, Miss Angel? Yes, again, and serve them right. Yes, I presume you've been persistently unpunctual. You're wrong, Eggie. It's rank injustice. I think the BBC had to kind of rethink their output a little bit to, to sort of take account of the fact that they were now covering a much wider spectrum of um, society geographically and sort of in terms of class and what, what the interests would be accordingly. The answer was The Grove Family, Britain's first TV soap opera. It ran from 1954 to 1957 and was hugely popular across the country. I shall be delighted to paddle with you. It was quite an ambitious programme. They, they concentrated most of the work in studio, but they didn't want to sort of just stick to that. And occasionally the family would go off on holiday or have a visit out. And they, they experimented with using filmed inserts for this, which was um, they, they'd do a scene in studio, and then when that was over, they'd cut to a scene they'd filmed before on film. Cue Telesino. And very often you could see the joins. And the action then cleverly linked back from film to studio. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm not here for you to play jokes, son. What's up, then? The ratings were, were quite high, but of course we didn't have ITV, so it was only BBC then, and we were the family serial at that time. The first family serial. Um, it was very exciting because we were very popular, there was a lot of recognition and, and we, were, we were acting every week. You know, we got a, a, a lot of people, you know, building sites calling out, you know, Hello, Pat! <laughs> Any more bacon, Pat? No, there isn't. And would you take these plates into the kitchen and start washing up? The Grove family got its name because in 1954, when this programme was introduced, the BBC had just moved to new studios in Lime Grove. The family was named after the, the new kind of home of the BBC. Off we go then. Oh, hello, Jane. Hello. Well, we better go in our body into Grand's room, say goodbye. Oh, I don't think she's yeah. up yet. Oh. What I thought was the most stressful, if I'm looking back on it, was the journey between sets. So your scene would finish, the red light would go off on the camera, and you had to know exactly where you were going, where the next set was, and where the cameras were going. Because the cameras would have to move very, very quickly. They, they may have to go from one end of the studio to the other. And there'd be this huge swishing sound as, as the cameramen, with the cables, and, and the cameramen would sort of manoeuvre their way through. And we had to avoid tripping over the cables, getting to the other side of the studio, appearing relaxed. Cheer up, Gran. I'm worried. And then there were the costume changes. Sometimes you just had to kind of strip off and, and get there as quickly as you possibly could. <laughs> what part? Oh, oh, may we have the board, please? The pressure on the actors was immense, including last-minute script changes from the floor manager to keep the production to time. It's not surprising they fluffed the odd line. that's going on, anybody might think you were going for good. Well, it's a bungalow, Gran, and we're taking our own linen. I'd better get this long a lot to the, the, the bedroom. Oh, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> but you had to carry on, obviously. Now listen, for 50 out of 52 weeks you work and toil for me. What 
Whatever I ask for, you get it for me. But the, other but the nation forgave any imperfections and the Grove family even got royal approval when the Queen Mother visited the studio in 1957. It was very exciting when we heard that the Queen Mother had enjoyed our programme and we all nodded or curtsied or whatever. I think we curtsied actually then. You know, it was great fun for us to think that we got up in there with the palaces somewhere. <laughs> During the 1950s, improving TV technology started to free technicians and directors from their stagey theatrical traditions. They learned how moving cameras and different lenses could be used for dramatic effect. Horrible sight, but there you are. That's a close-up without my moving at all, or you. Now spin to a long shot. And there you have a long shot. And you can see to embrace the technology, before. new writers were brought in to provide ambitious stories specially written for television. Nigel Neal was the first to break away from the style of the traditional TV play with a daring piece of live television that stunned viewers. The revolutionary science fiction series Quatermass was Neal's grand vision to create drama different from anything ever seen on TV before. The sort of things they had traditionally put out then tend to be rather slow moving, a bit ponderous, but ours didn't. Ours went very fast. Five, four, three, two, one. Live on air, Neil used an ambitious combination of location filming and huge studio sets. Carefully choreographed camera moves gave a dynamic feel far removed from the world of theatre, while close-ups drew viewers into the detail of this science fiction world. Everybody was absolutely enraptured by it. It was the topic of conversation the following morning across the land. Control to Quatermass. Information, please. Over. Quatermass to control. Velocity 32,000 miles per hour. Course as directed. We're suffering. G effects. Give me a few minutes. Over. Quatermass was a difficult act to follow, but the public appetite for science fiction meant Nigel Neal's adaptation of 1984, although still called a play, would stretch the live studio to the limit. 1984 was the next big job. And um, we had proper studios to work in, so that was easy and comfortable. In fact, we had two whole studios, not just one for the actors. Another one for the orchestra, a live orchestra. Comrades, attention! But even with the most elaborate planning, a live broadcast can be thrown into disarray by a simple hiccup, like a missing prop. As the show began, somebody realized that the key prop, which is a Victorian paperweight had been stolen. Panic in the studio, horror. How would we do? How do you solve this? The show can't be stopped, it's going, it's rolling now. So the ASM girl had the best thing she could produce, which is a Mickey Mouse set with drops of snow inside a globe. And that is what appeared in front of Peter Cushing that he had his line to say, this is so beautiful. It's like snow falling inside there. Of course, it's filled with water and the white particles oh, it's are beautiful. Yes. Viewers were brought back to reality in 1955 when one of the BBC's longest running series started its beat. Ah, oh, good evening all. Well, I'm the mug tonight. Dixon of Doc Green. It had a very cosy feel. It dealt with a small neighbourhood where everybody knew each other and it's slightly 
had a nostalgic feel even at the time it went out. It was a safe world it portrayed. So it, it was very moralistic, um, comfortable drama. Well, it's none of my business, I suppose, but I thought I saw you with a young woman the other night, the corner of Blackwell Road. Friday night, it was. Oh, well, the uh, woman from the commercial art studio, I suppose. Oh, a business acquaintance, eh? Peter Byrne and the late Jack Warner developed techniques to help each other with the live performance. In early days of television, you had to keep going. If somebody, your opposite number, dried on you, you went, I know what you're thinking, and then you told him his lines, and hopefully he picked it up, and on you go. I had a <laughs> series of signals with Jack that if he did this, that means I'm not too sure of the next line. <laughs> If he did that, I'm about to go, and if he did that, he'd gone completely, so you, you picked it up from there. Hello, you two. Andy, this is Mr. Wayne. Dixon of Doc Green would run for 21 years and over 400 episodes. So it's not surprising that some of the live transmissions didn't always go according to rehearsals. Yes. The actor had to punch me on the jaw. And I rehearsed with him. We came in early every morning, you know. Unfortunately, on the live broadcast, because he was nervous, he caught me flush on the jaw. Why did you think she behaved like this? Hey! I landed on the deck. Now then! You yeah, stop it! Now listen, George! Stop it! Not, shut up! I was so livid. We had a bit of a set to it in the, in the uh, corridor afterwards, but poor chap, it wasn't his fault, really. As actors got used to the medium, they started to appreciate what the live studio had to offer and adopted a more intimate style of performing. When I'm playing in this theatre, playing to 600 people, but on television, you've got to consciously play to those two or three people in the living room. So you've got to scale it down. You've got to ignore that dreadful, unforgiving, beady eye that really, it strips you away if you're insincere. You've really got to play for real. Yeah, but in fairness to me, I stood, they say I'm going around with another woman. They even bring grace into it. You never achieve the perfect performance, but there are occasions when you get near. And somehow with a live television broadcast, you sensed, somehow you sensed, even though you couldn't be, be certain, but you knew when you were giving a good performance. The only snag was that you never saw the result. Now, why bring that up? Well, you offered to pay for it, sport. Yeah, I know, I want my head examined. Still, we did have the loan of the car. That's a fair exchange. Thank you again, car. My abiding memory of, of television, apart from the heat and the dust and the noise, was that wonderful, challenging moment when that red light used to go on and you were cued and you knew that there were millions of people watching you and it was that gambler's throw. You were either very good or very bad. Next week we'll be back in the green as usual. See you then and good night. Established BBC dramas like Dixon of Doc Green were challenged from 1955 when rival ITV came on the air. And now, for your Sunday night dramatic entertainment, we bring you Armchair Theatre. In direct competition to the BBC's Sunday night drama slot, ITV's powerful series Armchair Theatre also went out live but capitalised on viewers' growing taste for everyday realism. Oh, uh, uh, this is Val. You were uh, stopping here then, lad? That's right. Which room? The door's locked. Uh, Val's a student, Harry. She's got a holiday job on Miles. I'm a student myself. The form? Have got any fags? Armchair Theatre tapped into that appetite, if you like, that, that suddenly they stopped doing these rather static, middle-class, light um, society plays, and they, they started to reflect the real world back to their audience. What about you, sir? Oh. The bingo. Ah, look at the You're out of your class, boy. Hey. Heads or tails? Hey. Hard luck. You're in an art school, son. Thanks, lovely. Get off, you ain't. Oh, it's you, is it? Do you know him? Know him? Who doesn't know him? It hasn't been done by him. I wouldn't have him on my conscience. I think that was when television really began to be an art form in its own right. That, that, that the drama suddenly 
coalesced and came together with Armchair Theatre and from then on really good writers started to come into television and write plays specifically for this medium and really good actors thought this is better than we reckoned and we want to be a part of it. One BBC response to the realism of Armchair Theatre was a new live hard-hitting police series. Z Cars started in 1962 and ran for 667 episodes. Right. How would you like to join it? Well, why do you think to get rid of this rain? Z Cars had much more of a documentary feel about it. I think it lost that sort of homely feel that Dixon of Doc Green had had. They were able to use filmed inserts and these showed the coppers going out onto Liverpool housing estates and into the real world. It wasn't sort of comfortable village life almost that, that Dixon portrayed. Z Cars used an unprecedented realistic documentary style of filming, recording genuine location sound to integrate with the studio action. It's live, it was a live show, and 45 minutes was live and 5 minutes was filmed. You filmed the, the filming ahead of time, but for 45 minutes you were live in the studio. And you basically had an audience of 18 million, they were bigger than Coronation Street or EastEnders. Massive audiences, and it's that clock beats on a live show. Stratford Johns would vomit for two hours, not, he couldn't stop vomiting. I mean, Frank Windsor would go into a kind of nervous paroxysms. Jock, thank God it wasn't in colour, would go red like a tomato. And when that red light went on, your guts went into your heart. Oh, stand by! You're going first to Telly Sin for the titles and then straight into you, Brian. How do you mean, how much? Well, if you fancy them. Nah, I got more to do with my cash. What, then losers? Is that what you were going to say? How much do you reckon, then? Five bob. What odds are you giving? Odds? You're the one that fancies them. Going out live really had, it just made it completely real. But the BBC thought they would like to try one where we recorded it. And we dried. We dried, it was dead, it was useless. So they abandoned it and three weeks later they fitted it in and we did that one live and then it was marvellous. 174, go to the fire at 20 Kingswood Avenue Seaport, assist. That's one thing I never reckoned. No, what's that? The use of cars in the studio, the use of sets in the studio and to a great extent the personalities involved in the script writers, it all created a kind of feeling of moving forward. I think the directors and the heads of BBC realised they got something totally original and they realized that the kind of sky was the limit. And so we actually started to break the boundaries of studios. It was the most technically advanced production so far, broadcasting every week live from 15 sets in the studio using five separate cameras. So what you done there? Well, nothing. And that's what they want to ask you about, is it? Nothing. Hey, oh, you cut it shut out. up, both of you. Now leave it alone, Now will look, you? you both of you, this is my house and my daughter, and I'm talking yeah, to her. Yeah, there's no need to talk about that. And that's nothing to do with you, neither. Now, just a minute. I said you could come in here, didn't I? Aye. Well, now I'm telling you to get out. Z Cars also refined the illusion of back projection on TV, where moving film was shown behind a static car in the studio. It meant the actors had to synchronise their driving with the film. We had side projection of there, side projection of there, and back projection behind us. So you reverse the car at times, and you would look behind, and you reverse, and you had to time it. You had to time it in the studio, on the live shows. You had to time your reversing. And then send somebody, you'd look for a bit, and then you put it in reverse when you saw it was going in reverse. Give it a rest, and you have to knock it about. The studio cars were also modified to help shooting. Their windscreens were removed to stop camera reflections, but that meant the actors could inadvertently do the impossible on the live show. Here's a Zephyr, and of course my hat was there. So live in the studio, which got millions of people phoning through, there was no glass on it, so the camera could come right through into your face. And I forgot on a live show and I picked it up straight away and then I put it on my head and I thought, oh God, I put my hand through the glass. There's no glass there. People said, has Fancy Smith actually put his hand through the screen and put it on? I did that several times. I also did it with the radio. I reached in when the radio rang and grabbed the radio because there was no glass there. And picked the radio up and as, as I'm talking, yes, BD, it's every two to BD. And I thought, oh, bloody hell. I don't film for 32 seconds. 
it was crucial to keep to time. Forgetting the odd line could be a problem, but forgetting a whole scene was a lot more serious. On one occasion, I had to arrest John Hurt. And he was petrified, you know, as people were guests. We got used to it. And as I approached him, I said, now then, come on, come on, come on. I'll have a word with you. And he said, I'm guilty. And that was a 10 minute scene gone. And I said, well, you better come with me then. And I, I looked at the camera, walked past the camera and said, cue the next scene, cue the next scene. And the news went out 10 minutes earlier that night. During the early 1960s, many new live productions emerged, including soaps like Compact and a string of single dramas. The discipline of directors like Alan Bridges was needed to get the cast and crew through the relentless schedule leading up to each transmission. One would first meet the cast after about four to five weeks preparation um, and de um, designing the sets with the designer, okay, talking about the lighting with the, the lighting artist um, and even sound. Cue factory noise. A man is what he makes. We would meet the, the cast um, and have about three weeks of rehearsal in a rehearsal room, um, usually an old army uh, territorial drill hall. Would it be good if she gave me the hammer? Yes, Grand. You won't touch it! If you've got a job, I'll enter you. Well, do it then. Then we would come into the studio and we would rehearse it, I think, in on the floor. I think we had, for a big two-hour live show, I think we had three days on the floor. OK, all right, Ron, from the same place, please. Well, I've done all the thinking and I've decided for you. You, you've decided now, you've thrown your hand in. And mine. When you retire, I'll have the way to this place on my shoulders. Look rather good, actually. Okey doke. And then we went out live over two hours late in the evening, and it was very exciting and very wearing. Five, four, three. Shot one, six next. Cut out. Some of the admiral, would you like to swap over for a bit? You won't touch it. You don't. You can keep your ruddy bed there. So the light has gone off uh, at the end of the credits, and, and I thought I'd love to do that again. I did that badly. Videotape recording had been available since the late 1950s, but it had hardly been used in drama. While some directors felt that it could give them more control of their productions, there was uncertainty as to how it would affect the performance of the cast. I think the actors were, were quite reluctant to lose the live facility because you'd think that it would be a terrible ordeal and they'd all be terrified and the nerves would be prohibitive and there were too many variables but actually a lot of the actors I spoke to in my researches found that when the performance was live they retained control of it. Mary. What is it? I'm leaving you. You're much more in control of your performance when it's live. So that wonderful pause that you used to get, that dangerous pause. When I come off duty tomorrow I'll look for fresh digs. Well, no, Andy, that's Well, tell me what's wrong, then. If you're underrunning these days, they can tweak out little bits of that. You, when you see it, you think, hmm, that pause wasn't as good as I thought it was. In actual fact, you've taken up milliseconds. You're in the hands of the editor and so on, rather like in movies. They can totally change your performance in many ways, you know. Oh, Andy, I do love you. You must believe that. Of course I do. I feel the same way, too. By the mid-60s, as video recording became routine elsewhere, there were doubts whether staying live really did give the viewers the best drama. If you look back at those live dramas now, they seem a little bit limited and maybe a little bit awkward in terms of how they get from one scene to another. And the pace of them is significantly slower than it is today. Sometimes that slowness of pace is really works well and allows you to get under the skin of the characters. But the slowness of the pace is because we're actually cutting quite clumsily from one live set to another live set. Then maybe it's, it's not as good as it could be technology that was now available meant that you could switch locations, you could film in studio, you could film outside. There were far more broad possibilities opening up and other fish to fry. The confusingly called Wednesday plays were in fact now only distantly related to stage drama. You're not 
Gritty stories like Cathy Come Home were totally recorded and edited on film and gave viewers a taste for cinematic pace and realism. Good evening, all. By the 70s, most dramas, including Z Dixon cars, of Doc Green nice. and Z Cars, mm. were recorded. Hey, can you smell gas out there? I can smell it in here. It looked like live drama had died. Good God. But in the 80s, there was a brave revival. And now on to the opening play in a new series of dramas direct from the BBC's Pebble Mill Studios in Birmingham. In a bold experiment, BBC Two's series of one-hour live broadcasts significantly started with a very theatrical staging of the Battle of Waterloo. Everything in the studio was live, except the horses. I warned you about it. It's not my responsibility, is it, too? We couldn't stop her! Come on! Afraid, are you? You can't break us, you know. You'll never break us. We can't be broken. We're a bloody colour company! Fire for the command! The 1983 series of live dramas also included a medical farce featuring a young Leslie Phillips. Where did you get the money for this quite unnecessary and very expensive cosmetic surgery? I took out a second mortgage on the house. My house? Mm. Our house? Yeah. How dare you? What? After all you said? Oh, no. After no. all no. I no. said! It was a very different piece of medical drama that heralded a resurgence of interest in going live 14 years later. In 1997, America was hooked by a live episode of ER. The trend was set for revitalizing long-running series with special live editions. Over here in 2000, we gave the honor to a piece of pure soap. It was the 40th anniversary of Coronation Street, so that was also broadcast live because I believe one or two of the very early episodes went out live, so it was obviously returning Hello. to their roots Hello. in that Hello. sense. What's all this then? It's a demonstration. Local residents are trying to stop the council tarmacking over at Cobbles. Let me guess, this uh, demonstration wouldn't be led by an ageing left-wing firebrand called Kenneth Barlow, would it? He did have a lot to do with it, yeah. Prince Charles actually made a, a cameo appearance on that one. Oh, look! No! <laughs> no, it's Audrey! And the news! <laughs> oh, no, we'll never hear the last of this. Oh, she looks lovely. Oh, I bet she loved it. <laughs> hey, what she said? I don't know what she's giving him. <laughs> <laughs> it was probably a gimmick with a, a useful side effect that, that, in terms of the ratings, if you announce this is going out live, then you might attract a few extra viewers. But I think the knock-on effects for the actors is that it does crisp them up. I've lived here all my life. I've seen a lot of people come and go, a lot of changes, a lot of dramas down this street. <laughs> like lots of other streets where people are living and trying to get together. It's just that I find there's something a little bit special about this one. Uh. The latest long-running series to go out live was the most daring yet. In 2003, The Bill was celebrating 20 years on air. The decision to go live was designed to boost both ratings and the morale of the cast and crew. There was a big difference between the performances on the live episode compared to um, a recorded episode because the extra pressure of having to get it right, obviously the adrenaline was high and I think the actual performances in some cases sort of benefited from that and I think it gave the show a certain impetus and drive that really made it quite exciting to watch as well. What's his name? Oh, uh, Mark, my name is Sir, but I've tried to talk to him, he won't listen. Whereabouts in the van, is he? He's in the middle, he can't get out, but he won't let her out either. Okay, what's his history? Well, he's drunk, he, he was smashing up a phone box. I mean, I didn't know he had a knife, sir. Kathy, <laughs> calm. What we need is calm yeah. and focus. Yeah, fine. This was so ambitious, and you knew you weren't going to be able to do it again. Um, so if it did go wrong, that was it. It's a sort of stress, but actually, how many people can say they're going to turn up at work today and they're going to be on tenterhooks in front of 13 million people? That's got to be a buzz. You left me for an, an unstable, middle-aged woman who is drinking herself to death. 
it was extremely high pressured. I mean, obviously, you know, it wasn't just for the actors for lines, which was hard enough, but it was all the the technical stuff, which was oh, so complicated. I think we had something like 22 cameramen and, you know, 30 miles of cable or whatever. And actually just the logistics of moving around this building and trying to get one thing following straight onto another, it, it was extremely difficult. Sorry, I'm afraid we've had some news and it's not good. The live episode was about double the cost of the normal bill episode. So, um, there, it's debatable whether, you know, it was value for money. I don't want any trouble. We'll do it your way! Well, well obviously one of the main reasons we did it live was, was because that does generate a lot of publicity. I think that, that has to be a, a, one of the reasons. I think the other reason is to prove that you can do it. The live bill was a hit with actors and viewers. But it was another Bill, William Shakespeare, who was to bring the story of live drama full circle. The broadcast, also in 2003, of Shakespeare's Richard II returned live TV drama to its classic theatre beginnings, but with a nod to the 21st century. May I ask you please to double check that you've switched off all watch alarms, pages and mobile phones? <laughs> what a no post dispatch for Ireland? What should we do for money for these wars? Sister, come. Oh, cousin, I would say, pray, pardon me. A gentleman, will you go master man? I thought that the Richard II that we did live from the Globe was an absolutely fantastic piece of theatre. Um, and I think it was a fantastic piece of theatre, both in the true sense of a piece of theatre that we saw the Globe doing their version of Richard II, and a fantastic piece of theatre for BBC Four. In God's name and the Kings, say who thou art and why thou comest us knightly clad in arms, against what man thou comest and what thy quarrel. Speak truly on thy knighthood and thy oath. And so defend thee, heaven and thy valour. It felt like a real event. It felt like you were genuinely attending the Globe in the way that the members of the audience were. With recent live drama capitalising so successfully on its theatrical roots, what's next? Audiences like to have some input now, as we see, you know, with the Big Brother celebrity get me out of here scenarios. They like to have some input on what's happening. And I think there is a way of presenting drama where they can have more say in the outcome. So one future might be interactive drama, where viewers control the plot lines. But will TV channels still commission pure live drama? If someone came to me tomorrow with a proposal for a live drama, I would ask why we're we doing it live. And if I felt that the reasons as to why we're doing it live is that it would be really exciting for everyone who was making it, including the actors, then I would ask them to go back and look at that proposal again. The liveness has got to be exciting for the audience first and foremost, and then it can be exciting for all the people who are making it. If live TV drama will now always be the exception rather than the rule, its long history should at least remind us how much television still owes to its early pioneers who had to invent the medium from scratch. Q roller. On six. Mix. Thank you. Many, many thanks. That's a lot, Studio. Thank you. Fade sound and vision. Right, that's it, Studio. Thank you very much, boys. Thank you.